Well, I would say that the purpose of this series was kind of twofold, this Wonder Women series that we're wrapping up today. One of them was just to have something fun to do for the summer because a, 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 a clergy friend of mine, a, a church had, a, had a really good um, um, a comic style artist who put together all of these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, pictures and animations. Uh, and so it's fun, but, but that's not the main purpose. The main purpose of this series has been to give more voice to some of the stories of women that we see in scriptures to lift up the stories that don't get lifted up enough and to let their voices inform and inspire ours. And two of the women in the series were ones that, uh, well, if you've been around church much, you've probably heard of them already. Those are uh, Esther and Mary Magdalene. In the, in the drawings, those are the two that are in the middle uh, um, in, the, in the other image that we have up sometimes. Uh, and, and the two you may not be familiar with, though, was Deborah in the first week of the series. Uh, Deborah the warrior as we called her, but uh, a warrior in a different way than is oftentimes seen and made sure that, uh, that uh, it stayed focused on God. And today we have the story of Lydia the Brave. And I will admit, this is my favorite of the sermons in the series for a couple of reasons. One of which is she's probably the most obscure of any of them. There's only, I believe it's five verses in the entire Bible that are even remotely about her. And they say, almost nothing. They say very few words. Yet, from those few words that are there, we can extrapolate? Is that the right word? We can pull so much information about who Lydia is and about her story. And when you begin to think about it, it is truly remarkable what she did and inspiring. So, let's get into it. Uh, as the uh, introduction uh, video uh, showed, the, uh, what was going on at the time is that the early church was beginning to spread. So there was obviously the life of Jesus and the crucifixion and the resurrection and Pentecost, if you know those stories. But afterwards, Jesus' disciples became apostles. They became one who took uh, the news of what Jesus had done and of the transformation that God was bringing to the world that took it out to, uh, to share it to all people so that everyone could hear, not only those that happened to live in a particular place and at a particular time. They uh, traveled from place to place, planting churches and, uh, and having amazing encounters along the way. Their travel needs were met sometimes by the churches that were already established. They would send funds and supplies to, supplies to help them on their way. Oftentimes, they would, uh, they, would, uh, they would meet people along the way who would support them on their journey. But that's not all of the story. The other side of it is the persecution. Because this new movement of, well, the word Christian hadn't been invented yet. They were called followers of the way or followers of Jesus. These followers of the way were a threat to the Roman Empire. They were a threat to, to those who were in charge of the, uh, uh, of the Jewish uh, um, synagogues and, and uh, religion at the time, the religious leaders. Uh, and so they were persecuted. And, I do, and I, that, that word almost sounds too small. They were imprisoned. They were beaten. They were killed. They were stoned to death. And so being a Christian was a risk. Yet, so many people had such, an, such a profound experience of the divine in their life that they couldn't not. And so they met in homes. It was an underground church trying to be secret, trying to invite, be, both invite everyone in, but also keep it quiet from those who might do them harm along the way. And the church continued to grow. That's where we pick up the story in Acts chapter 16. Uh, um, Paul and some of his companions are uh, traveling out uh, on these journeys from place to place to try to spread the news and begin new churches and homes along the way. It begins like this. From there, he was telling about other stops on his journey. From there, we went to Philippi, a city of Macedonia's first district and a Roman colony. We stayed in that city several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to a river bank where we thought there might be a place for prayer. Now, could I put that in more modern terms? 
They wanted church. <laughs> they were looking for a place that they could go to worship God. There wasn't anything established there uh, in Philippi yet. And so they knew, they, they knew there was a river outside of town. Uh, I'm going to guess that they saw a place that was a little bit shielded, maybe by trees or whatever. I don't know. Uh, hard to know exactly what was going on, but they would have wanted it to be private. And so they left the city gates and they went to this place that they thought would give them some privacy and some shelter that they could do church as we would say today. I'll continue here. We sat down and began to talk with the women who had gathered. So there were already people there when they got there. One of these women was Lydia, a Gentile God worshiper from the city of Thyatira. Okay, now I got to unpack that too. Lydia was a Gentile God worshiper. Now, we know, uh, even from our own day, that there, there, uh, when, when you say, when you say a, a Jew or Jewish, you could mean two different things. You could mean culturally Jewish, but you could also mean the religion of Judaism and following of Yahweh, God. And oftentimes those are one and the same, but not quite always. And there's something similar going on here. So Gentile means somebody who is not culturally Jewish, but the Greek word that's translated here as God worshiper means somebody who worships Yahweh, who practices that religion. So to say that Lydia was a Gentile God worshiper means that she was not culturally Jewish, but that she had seen and, and been drawn to something in the Jewish religion. And so she was a believer in Yahweh. She was practicing her faith even though she was not culturally Jewish herself. Now one could guess that all the women who had gathered along this riverbank in what was probably a secluded spot were probably similar. So Paul and his companions go looking for a place to do church and they find it. They find people already there worshiping God, even though they had not yet heard of Jesus. I'll continue. One of these women was Lydia, a Gentile God worshiper from the city of Thyatira, a dealer in purple cloth. Oh, the volumes those words contain. A dealer in purple cloth. So she was a businesswoman. She was a dealer, right? So now this is, this, uh, the, the, it was so rare in those days for a woman to be, in a, to, be a, to, to be a powerful businesswoman like that. So Lydia was already a powerful person and somebody worth looking up to because of what she would have had to overcome to be in the spot of being a dealer. But purple cloth is a clue too because purple dye was exceptionally expensive. If you've ever learned about art in ages past, purple and blue are always the most difficult colors because of, because of how expensive they were. Uh, and so for her, and in her day, the only people who would have had purple cloth would be kings and the very wealthy. Usually purple is associated with royalty because royalty were the only ones who could afford it. So with that in mind, hear it again. Lydia was a dealer in purple cloth. Not only was she a businesswoman in the first century, but she was selling high-end stuff. She was going and talking and doing business deals and selling to the most powerful and rich people of her day. Now that's pretty impressive right there, isn't it? Can you imagine the stories that she has to tell? We also get the idea that she probably traveled quite a bit. The story is taking place in Philippi, but she was from Thyatira. I'm not going to put a map up, but that alone is a clue that she travels a lot. But at the same time, if you're dealing in something that that's, high, that's that high end, you probably can't stay in one place anyway. You have to travel to the wealthy that are in each city to sell your purple cloth. And so Lydia is not any ordinary woman. She's a high-powered businesswoman selling the high-end things and constantly dealing with the rich and the powerful. <laughs> That's a good story right there. If only we knew more about her life. So one of these women was Lydia, a Gentile God worshiper from Thyatira, a dealer in purple cloth. As she listened to Paul and his companions, the Lord enabled her to embrace Paul's message. It's kind of an idiom. Jesus changed her heart when she heard the story. Once she and her household were baptized, she urged, now that you have decided that I am a believer in the Lord, come and stay in my house. 
and she persuaded us, they write. Remember what I said about how Christians were persecuted? The church was hidden for a reason. Because if somebody knew that you were a follower of the way, you could be beaten, you could be imprisoned, you could be punished, you could be stoned to death and killed. That's what it meant to be a follower of the way. For Lydia, she was the one dealing with the rich and the powerful. If word got around that she was associating with these Jesus followers, what do you think it would have done to her business? <laughs> Lydia was stepping out on a limb. She was taking a huge risk. She was willing to risk her business, her wealth, her lifestyle. She was willing to risk everything that she undoubtedly had to work very hard to get because of how Jesus had transformed her heart in that meeting along the riverbank at church that day. Lydia the brave indeed. <laughs> After that, after they stay with her for I forget how long, uh, Paul and the other apostles uh, go out and they go on another one of their adventures. And in fact, if you want something fun to read this afternoon, it's not even very long. The rest of chapter 16 in Acts, uh, it's quite a story. There's this thing with a fortune telling uh, woman uh, who they realize is, uh, uh, needs help. And so they help her, but then she can't tell fortunes anymore. And then the person that was, uh, th that was profiting from her telling of fortunes get mad at them, turns them into authorities. Uh, Paul and the apostles get beaten and thrown in prison, just like I was saying. There's an earthquake that makes them uh, leave the prison, that, 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 that lets them escape it, but they end up converting the jailer who was there and about to kill himself. I don't know. It's a whole story. You get the idea? It was a thing. <laughs> and after all of this is done, after all of this is done, can you imagine the wanted posters that were being put up of Paul and his companions after all this? They go back through Thyatira to, through Thyatira on their way back to wherever they're headed next. And the chapter ends like this. Paul and Silas left the prison and made their way to Lydia's house where they encouraged their brothers and sisters and then they left Philippi. <laughs> and so she not only took them in, but she took them in again even after more messy things had happened. Lydia the brave. Now, as with all of these women in this series, I have three questions, at least three questions that I think Lydia asks to us. And we have them on the screen too. The first one is this. Have you opened your heart to Jesus? Now, Lydia was already spiritual and religious. When they went to the riverbank to worship, Lydia was one who was already there. She was already doing her best to follow God. But in that moment on that day, her heart opened wider. She saw more of what God was doing in the world in Jesus, and it changed her. And not only did it change her, but it was the first step to the most impactful thing she ever did with her life, the simple but risky act of opening her home to the apostles. And so what about you? Have you fully opened your heart to Jesus? You know, all of us are here because there's something, because we're open to the things that are bigger than us in some way or shape. But have you truly opened yourself to welcome Jesus' transformation in? That's the first question I think this scripture asks us. Have you opened your heart to Jesus? Second, what are you willing to risk? Lydia was willing to risk her wealth her business, her lifestyle, to help spread the word of Jesus. If you had been her, would you have done the same? You know, I'd like to think I would have. <laughs> I probably would have hesitated a little more than she did, but I don't think any of us really knows until we're faced with such a moment. But what we can ask is what we are willing to risk. Is it worth the kind of risk that Lydia took to help spread the word of God and to help spread that love to those who need it. The third question is this, what are you afraid of? Now, Lydia was brave. She clearly wasn't afraid of losing everything. Or maybe she was afraid, but it was worth it to her anyway. I suppose that's the very definition of what it means to be brave. But as we're drawn to her story, it's worth asking, what are you afraid of? What holds you back 
You know, I'm tempted to joke, maybe nothing holds you back, but that's not true. We all are, are held back by fears of various sorts. Are you afraid of embarrassment? Are you afraid of suffering? Are you afraid of being wrong? Are you afraid of losing stability? Or are you more afraid of a life without meaning? Because to me, that's an even bigger risk than any of it. This is important to ask because facing our fear is part of how we grow into the kind of bravery we see in Lydia. You know, this sermon series on Wonder Women of the Faith has really been something. You know, we planned this months ago. We had no idea what was going to be happening at the time the actual sermons were preached. And sometimes it's amazing how God works through things. So one of the sermon in the series on Esther is about political violence. And as it happens, it was right after the assassination attempt of a former president and a political candidate. <laughs> That was a moment, I'll tell you, for me as a preacher to, uh, to watch those events unfolding knowing that uh, I was about to talk about Esther. And then we have this big building meeting to talk about what we're doing as a church and to talk about risk and the need to step out in faith. And then three days after the meeting, we have a sermon on Lydia. We couldn't have planned it so well. You know, part of what I realized at that meeting on Thursday was that there's no way any church can build a building without stepping out in faith. There's no way anyone could do something that big without risk and without bravery and trust for that matter because we know that we won't be able to control every little thing that happens in every part of it. We know that there will be parts of the process that we don't quite agree with, but we have to trust one another enough to be able to step out and do it because there's no other way anything that big ever happens. And of course, also trust that God is in the process along the way. Like I say, there's going to be a lot more information to come on the building thing, not to mention the church conference on the 18th. But for now, like all the women in this series, Lydia gives us something to aspire to. You know, it's not a blind risk. It's not a blind trust. It's based on the experience that we've had in Jesus. It's based on the experience of what we've seen God do in the world. And I think we could do a lot worse than to ask ourselves, have you opened your heart to Jesus? What are you willing to risk? And what are you afraid of? Because that's what helps us become brave. All right, I'll close with one last note. Remember what I said about how it's amazing how much you can tease out of small, out of small details in the story of Lydia? Well, there's one more. And in fact, it's in a completely different part of the Bible, the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible. It was written about 90 years after the events of this story take place. And uh, John, who wrote it, one of the things that he does is he, uh, there's a list of, I believe it's 13 churches that were prominent in that day. So 90 years after the events of this story, there's, we have a list of churches that were prominent. And you know what? Thyatira was one of them. Thyatira was one of them. That means that the events of that day on the side of that riverbank, when the stories that Paul told of how he'd met Jesus opened up the hearts of those around him, including, crucially, Lydia, who opened her doors to, to help the church to grow and to spread it ended up becoming one of the most prominent churches of the entire first century. <laughs> God did amazing things through that moment and through that act of bravery. This is why I said it was the most impactful thing that Lydia ever did. Thank heavens for her bravery. Now the question is, what will God do with your bravery? Would you pray with me? Oh God, thank you for Lydia and thank you for the small details in this story that tell us so much about who she was and about what she did for, well, for us, but really for you and for the spread of your kingdom in the world. 
Oh God, help us to learn from her. Help us to be drawn to her example. And when the right thing comes, when our opportunity comes to support the work that you are doing, may we be as brave as Lydia. We pray it in the name of the Jesus who transforms us. Amen.